Good day, dear great surgeon. Today we are gonna talk about a very important guitar topic, which is the neurosurgery. It's very hard for non-neurosurgeons, but together in this voice shot, we will make it a piece of cake for you. So let's go on and start together the voice shots for neurosurgery for MRCS. Take care. Raise in blood pressure occurs in increased intracranial hypertension and take care in a polytrauma patient when you are taking the vitals again the vitals are critical if you found the patient is hypertensive it's not normal to have post traumatic the patient hypertensive more likely to be normotensive or hypotensive from internal hemorrhage so if is he hypertensive take care of intracranial blood pressure it may be raised due to brain insult. So take care. And a great trick to use it in your life. If you found the patient is hypertensive, post traumatic, post RTA patient, think of the Cushing reflex always. The Cushing reflex is your key to this patient if he is having an increased intracranial blood pressure or not. Lateral medullary syndrome. It's a combination of ipsilateral ataxia, nystagmus, dysphagia, facial numbness, cranial nerve palsy with contralateral hemisensory loss indicates lateral medullary syndrome. Again, ipsilateral ataxia, ataxia on the same side with nystagmus, dysphagia, facial numbness, and cranial nerve palsy with contralateral on the other side hemisensory loss indicates lateral medullary syndrome. Take care. Lateral medullary syndrome, which is a posterior inferior cerebellar artery, not the posterior cerebral, but posterior inferior cerebellar artery regarding to the cerebellar. Lateral medullary syndrome, also called Wallenberg syndrome, with ipsilateral ataxia, nystagmus, dysphagia, facial numbness, cranial nerve palsy, and on the other side, there will be limb sensory loss. Differentiate between Wallenberg syndrome and Weber syndrome. Weber syndrome has ipsilateral palsy and contralateral weakness. But the Wallenberg syndrome, the Wallenberg syndrome is a lateral medullary syndrome, posterior inferior cerebellar artery syndrome. Posterior cerebral artery has contralateral hemianopia, the hemianopia on the other side, with macular sparing and disconnection syndrome. This is a posterior cerebral artery syndrome. The anterior cerebral artery has contralateral hemiparesis and sensory loss with lower extremity more than the upper extremity. So the anterior cerebral artery about contralateral hemiparesis, but the posterior cerebral artery about contralateral hemianopia. And both anterior and posterior have disconnection syndrome. So we now agreed on the anterior cerebral artery has contralateral hemiparesis and the posterior cerebral artery has contralateral hemianopia. Surprise, the middle cerebral artery has contralateral hemiparesis and contralateral hemianopia. So middle cerebral artery is a mix between anterior and posterior. So contralateral hemiparesis and sensory loss with upper extremity more than the lower extremity so it's not anterior cerebral artery because in anterior cerebral artery it's about the lower extremity more than the upper but the middle cerebral artery has the upper extremity more than the lower extremity and as well as it has contralateral hemiparesis it has also contralateral hemianopia it's combination between the anterior and the posterior and different from the anterior that it has the upper extremity more affected than the lower extremity which is different from the anterior cerebral artery as well as the key will be aphasia and the gaze abnormalities there is friend take care ataxia agnosia aphasia dysarsia apraxia or are different definitions don't confuse them from the A, 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 A. Ataxia is impaired ability to coordinate movement. Aphasia is impaired structure or organization of the language. The vernix will have receptive aphasia, while the broccus expressive non-fluent aphasia. The broccus area, if affected, it will cause aphasia. This is the aphasia of the broadcast area. It's non-fluent. 
while the ray, the vernix the vernix uh, aphidia is receptive fluent aphidia it's in burnt structure organization of the language while the ataxia again is in bird ability to coordinate movement and often seen as a staggering gait or postural imbalance agnosia is the loss of the ability to recognize intact sensation and memory this artia defect in articulation and instrumentation of the speech dearest great surgeon we agreed on the anterior cerebral artery has contralateral hemiparesis and sensory loss with the lower limb extremity more than the upper limb extremity take care contralateral hemiparesis and sensory loss because the posterior cerebral artery would be with contralateral hemianopia with macular sparing and the middle cerebral artery is contralateral hemiparesis and sensory loss along with hemianopia aphasia and gaze abnormalities but take care if the question is only stating the case is presenting only with isolated hemiparesis take care this is a lacunar lacunar so presence with isolated hemiparesis in sensory loss or hemiparesis with limb ataxia this is a lacunar not anterior the anterior will be contralateral hemiparesis sensory loss with the lower leg extremity more than the upper and disconnection syndrome but the lacunar will be isolated hemiparesis hemisensory loss or hemiparesis with limb ataxia this is a lacunar there is a big difference between hemiparesis and hemiplegia. Hemi means something occurring on one half of the body. So hemi, something occur on one half of the body. But paresis means weakness and plegia means paralysis. So hemiplegia means paralysis on one half of the body. Hemiparesis means weakness on one half of the body. So Hemiparesis, weakness on one half. Hemiplegia, paralysis on one half. Hemiplegia is not like hemiparesis. If you are rushing it during your study, you will be confused with the anterior cerebral artery and the lateral medullary syndrome, which is the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. Take care. Anterior cerebral artery will be a contralateral hemiparesis, weakness on one side, and sensory loss with lower extremity more than the upper extremity. But the lateral medullary syndrome, there is a big difference between them and no relation. The lateral medullary syndrome, which is the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, will be with ipsilateral ataxia, and nystagmus, dysphasia, facial numbness, cranial nerve palsy, contralateral sensory loss. But there is nothing about hemiparesis, there is no weakness, only sensory loss. Take care. So take care, in lateral medullary syndrome, the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, there will be ipsilateral ataxia on the same side, on the same side, ataxia in coordination of movement. But in the anterior cerebral artery, we are talking about a contralateral hemiparesis. Hemiparesis doesn't mean paralysis, means weakness. We are not about, talking about gait, he is weak. But in lateral medullary syndrome, the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, the cerebellar is all about coordination. He will lose the coordination, ipsilateral on the same side. This is ataxia. We are not talking about weakness of the, of the limb here. Take care. Big difference. Intraventricular hemorrhage. Acute neurological deterioration. In premature neonate, it usually due to intraventricular hemorrhage. The diagnosis is made by cranial ultrasound and development of the hydrocephalus may necessitate surgery in such poor neonates. Take care. In neonate, we can diagnose clearly with the cranial ultrasound because the fossa, the infracranial fossa, didn't close yet. The exam regarding the cavernous sinus syndrome I will either ask you about the deficit caused by affecting the cavernous sinus syndrome or will tell you the deficit and ask you what can cause all of these deficits. You have to know the content of the cavernous sinus. The content are mostly important nerves like the lateral wall component will be oculomotor nerve, trochlear nerve, ophthalmic nerve and the maxillary nerve and the content of the sinus 
from medial to lateral, in the internal carotid artery and sympathetic plexus and abducens nerve. So it's composed of a lot bunch of nerves which are important, all are important, and you have to take care of this area. It's a dangerous area of the nose. Uh, the cavernous sinus are bared and are sighted on the body of the sphenoid bone. It runs from the superior orbital fissure on the petrous temporal bone. Take care. It's important. The relations of the cavernous sinus, medially the pituitary fossa and the sphenoid sinus and laterally the temporal lobe. So it's a very dangerous area. Cavernous sinus syndrome is most commonly caused by cavernous sinus tumors. In this case, um, the nasopharyngeal malignancy has locally invaded the left cavernous sinus. The diagnosis will be based on the signs of pain of salmoplegia, proptosis, trigeminal nerve lesion, which is its ophthalmic branch, by the way, and the Horner syndrome. Other causes of the cavernous sinus syndrome, not only tumors, but an abscess in this area can cause cavernous sinus syndrome. Take care. Take care. There is a big difference between Sturge Weber syndrome and the Weber syndrome and the Wallenberg syndrome. Take care. Weber syndrome is posterior cerebral artery syndrome at the level of the branches of the midbrain. So we are talking about posterior cerebral artery, but at the level of the branches of the midbrain. The manifestation of the midbrain infarction at this level will be contralateral, contralateral hemiplegia, upper and lower extremities, and the very specific sign will be the cranial nerve 3, the third cranial nerve palsy, on the same side, so ipsilateral, lateral gaze weakness and diplobia of the cranial nerve of the third nerve palsy, and the contralateral hemiplegia. Take care. This is the Weber syndrome. So don't confuse the posterior cerebral artery at the left branch of the midbrain Weber syndrome with the third nerve palsy and the contralateral hemiplegia with the anterior cerebral artery which all don't have cranial nerve palsy. Third cranial nerve palsy is only in Weber syndrome. So if you are targeting cranial nerve palsy, third cranial nerve palsy, we are talking about Weber syndrome with the contralateral hemiplegia or hemiparesthesia. Uh, but the anterior cerebral artery will only have contralateral hemiparesis with no uh, affection of the third nerve. And again, we agreed on the posterior inferior cerebellar artery doesn't have anything to do with weakness or balaritis. It's all about ataxia. And the cranial nerve palsy with facial numbness. We are not talking about the third nerve palsy at all. Regarding homonymous quadrantinubia, the quadrantinubia will be caused due to a lesion in the temporal loop or the parietal loop and take care. If it's a lesion in the temporal loop, remember temporal is top, it's superior. And if the lesion is in the parietal loop, remember the parietal below, it's inferior. So temporal, it's top, it's superior. Parietal, it's a below, it's inferior. So temporal, top, superior. Parietal, below, inferior. And what lesion is caused in the left temporal loop would be causing the lesion in the left side. It's a homonymous quadrantinobia. But if it's a left temporal loop lesion, it will cause a right homonymous quadrantinobia. Again, the inferior Homonymous quadrantinobia, it's caused by a lesion inferior, so it's parietal, it's below. If it's a parietal left side, so it will be right side inferior homonymous quadrantinobia. Clear? Take care. By temporal hemianubia, it's caused due to a lesion in optic chasm. We all know this idea that. The optic chasm is responsible for by temporal hemianubia lesion if the lesion in the optic chasm. But sometimes the question in the exam is not targeting only the idea about the optic chasm itself, but telling you there is an upper quadrant defect more than the lower quadrant defect. It's more upper quadrant defect in the bitemporal hemianubia with upper quadrant defect. So take care. Inverse.
The upper quadrant effect is caused by inferior chiasmic compression. So, inferior chiasmic compression is most commonly due to, yes, the pituitary tumor. While if he asked you about the lower quadrant effect in bitemporal hema and you be in the exam more than the upper quadrant, so the compression on the optic chiasm is upper from the superior chiasmic compression. It's caused by the craniopharyngioma. So, if it's lower, compression will cause upper quadrant effect. If it's a higher, superior chiasmal compression will cause a lower quadrant effect. If the compression on the chiasm from up, it will cause inferior defect. If the compression on the chiasm from down, it will cause upper defect. And the chiasm, optic chiasm defect, is caused or causing a bitemporal hemianopia. The middle cerebral artery is involved in the total anterior circulation infarction, so it's apart from it. But the total anterior circulation involves both the middle and anterior cerebral artery, so it's a combination, so it will be more integrated. The main difference will be the higher cognitive dysfunction uh, will be found more aggressive in the total anterior circulation infarction. They both will be having hemiparesis and hemicentrolus and homonymous hemianopia, but the higher cognitive dysfunction will be more integrated in the total anterior circulation infarction, the TACI, more integrated than the MECA. Don't forget we have three names for the Wallenberg syndrome. The Wallenberg syndrome, lateral medullary syndrome, posterior inferior cerebellar artery syndrome. So three names, never forget any of them in the exam who will ask you about any of them. The lateral medullary syndrome is the same as the posterior inferior cerebellar artery syndrome, is the same as the Wallenberg syndrome, it's ipsilateral ataxia, nystagmus, dysphysia, facial numbers, and cranial nerve palsy, contralateral sensory loss, contralateral limb sensory loss. There is no hemiparalysis, there is no hemiparesthesia, there is no weakness in the limb, there is no paralysis in the limb. It's all about sensory and ataxia and nystagmus and dysphagia, facial numbers, no weakness, no weakness, no paralysis. Again, lateral medullary syndrome, Wallenberg, inferior cerebellar artery, no weakness, no weakness, no paralysis. Great surgeon. Extradural hematoma is due to middle meningeal artery rupture or laceration, which is branched from medullary artery, which extension from external carotid artery. Take care. It's a surgical emergency to evacuate the extradural hematoma. This is done by baritotemporal craniotomy. This is the modern surgery. But in rural areas, there is no neurosurgery. So they drill holes in the skull causing a bare holes to release this extradural hematoma. But when we are talking about modern surgery, the most benefit will be from baritotemporal craniotomy. By the way, remember the most common site for middle meningeal artery to be ruptured is the terion. Most common, you ask it question in the exam. It will ask you about the middle meningeal artery, what is branch from, and will ask you the most common to be uh, ruptured at in the terion and the relations of the terion and the bones forming the terion. So remember, the middle meningeal artery is a branch from the maxillary artery, which is a branch from the extra uh, cranial uh, <coughs> external carotid artery and most commonly ruptured at the terion. And the terion is the region where the frontal and parietal and temporal and the greater wing of the senoid bone join together to form the terion. Again, the terion with the most common uh, place to middle meningeal artery to be ruptured is the weakest point, is the most liable point to be uh, having extradular hematoma where the frontal, parietal, temporal, and the greater wing of sphenoid join together to form the terion, the weakest point of the skull where extradural hematoma uh, will be formed from the rupture of the middle meningeal artery and will require parietotemporal craniotomy surgical emergency. This is great surgeon. Keep the diffuse axonal injury in your mind when there is a trauma with acceleration and sudden deceleration like the whiplash injury. There are two components. There will be multiple hemorrhages and diffuse axonal damage in the white matter. Frequent causes are persistent vegetative state or morbidity in the trauma patients. The clinical symptoms are worse than the CT findings, by the way, and the MRI is more sensitive for diagnosis. It can be isolated with no or little association with the subarachnoid hemorrhage or subdural hematoma or even fracture. 
So up to two thirds occur with the junction of the gray and white matter due to the different densities of the tissue. The changes are mainly histological. Again, the changes are mainly histological. The clinical symptoms worse than the CT finding. So keep it in mind in whiplash injury, in acceleration and deceleration with multiple hemorrhage and diffuse axonal damage in the white matter. Left temporal lobe infarction will cause right superior quadrantinubia. So in order not to forget temporal top, temporal top and the left will cause the left infarction will cause the contralateral side affection. So left temporal will cause right superior quadrantinubia. While the parietal loop parietal below inferior. So the parietal will cause inferior. So if the question stating left parietal loop infarction, so it will be right inferior quadrantinubia. You can remember one and reverse the other. Let's add another visual field defect. The homonymous hemium anubia. We have three types of homonymous hemi anubia in congress and congress and macular spelling the incongress defect it's a lesion in the optic tract itself and the congress defect will cause a lesion of optic radiation or occipital cortex while the macular spelling is a lesion in the occipital cortex itself only so in congress defect will cause a lesion on optic tract the optic radiation will caused by congress defect in case you forget the in tract con red in tract con red so in congress optic tract congress optic radiation optic red Lachner effusion again involving perforating artery around the internal capsule, salams, and basal ganglia and will present only with isolated hemiparesis and hemisensory loss or hemiparesis with limb ataxia. There will be nothing else. Take care. Ebendimoma account for 33% of the CNS tumor in the children below 3 year old. They commonly arise in the fourth ventricle and can grow through the foramen of Lushka and Magendi. First grade surgeon, remember the CSF is secreted from the choroid plexus of the lateral and third and fourth ventricle and the interstitial space of the dura of the nerve root sleeves. The circulation starts at the lateral ventricle to the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle and central canal of the spinal cord ending at the subarachnoid space. At the subarachnoid space, the arachnoid granulations and the choroid plexus and lymphatics do absorb the CSF. The function of the CSF is the removal of the waste and cushioning of the brain and intracranial neurovascular structure, neural pointing and electrical hemostasis. This is great surgeon. Pay attention to the CSF circulation. It is started at the level of the lateral ventricle and go to the third ventricle through the foramen of Monroe and through the aqueduct of Sylvius. It travels from the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle. And at the foramen of Magindi and Lushke, it finds a pathway to the subarachnoid space of the brain and spinal cord and ending by reabsorption into the venous sinuses. This is the pathway of the CSF circulation. Administration of intravenous manitol reduces the acute phase of raised intracranial pressure. Again, manitol reduces the acute phase intracranial pressure raise. Here is great surgery. Remember that signature fracture is synonymous with depressive fracture. They are usually low velocity injury 
where the fracture impression resembles the injurious source. Like someone hit the skull with a hammer, the depression will take the shape of the hammer head.